Polish studying CS and statistics, and I'm a former data director here at Harvard Votes Challenge. First, I'd like to direct your attention to the screen above me for information on how to use the audio translation devices. Um, if you have not done so already, select channel one to listen in English and select channel two to listen in Korean. Before we begin, note the exits, which are located both on the park side and the JFK street side over there. In the event of emergency, please uh, locate the nearest exit and congregate outside at the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence all of your cell phones. Now join me in welcoming the Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, Doug Elmendorf. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me add my own warm welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at Harvard Kennedy School. It is my honor and pleasure today to introduce our distinguished guest, Yoon suk Yeol, the President of the Republic of Korea. In a few minutes, President Yoon will speak about the challenges to freedom in the world and about the appropriate responses to those challenges. After the President's remarks, he and Professor Joseph Nye will engage in a conversation, and then the President will take questions from the audience. Our mission at the Kennedy School is to improve public policy and public leadership around the world and the forum has long been a venue where heads of state speak about pressing policy issues facing the people of their countries and facing all peoples across the globe. I am delighted that so many of you are here today and watching today to hear President Yoon's perspective on pressing issues. South Korea has been a key ally of the United States for 70 years and has been described recently as an economic and technology superpower. Moreover, Harvard and the Kennedy School in particular have been closely engaged with economic and security issues in South Korea for many decades. Edward Mason, who was dean of this school from 1947 to 1958, Dwight Perkins, who was the director of the predecessor of our current Center for International Development, and other members of our faculty worked with Koreans on the economic development of their country. Graham Allison, Joe Nye, Ash Carter, and other members of our faculty had important roles in preventing the wider proliferation of nuclear weapons, a goal that was reinforced by the declaration that Presidents Biden and Yoon signed on Wednesday. And some key members of the Korean government are graduates of the Kennedy School or of other schools at Harvard, including Prime Minister Han duk Su. Foreign Minister Park Jin, the Director of the National Intelligence Service, Kim Kyu-hyun, and the Minister of Unification, Kwon young se We are pleased and honored to play such a constructive role in the country's success. President Yoon was inaugurated as the President of the Republic of Korea nearly one year ago, last May. He is a lawyer by training and a public prosecutor who served as Prosecutor General from 2019 to 2021. Throughout his career, he has been recognized for his skill and success in tackling high-profile corruption cases, and as Prosecutor General, he focused on fighting corruption. Now, in his current role, President Yoon has emphasized the importance of upholding values such as human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. He has pledged to work across the aisle to achieve progress that benefits everyone. He also believes strongly that Korea has a responsibility to the international community. As you all know, President Yoon made an official state visit to Washington, D.C. earlier this week. He spoke with President Biden and to a joint meeting of the U.S. Congress and was honored with a state dinner. President Biden emphasized the importance of the long-standing alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States, and the two presidents issued a joint statement outlining various aspects of collaboration between the two countries. We are so fortunate that President Yoon has decided to visit Harvard as part of his trip to this country. As I mentioned, President Yoon will be joined in conversation with Professor Joe Nye. Joe is a distinguished expert on international relations and an emeritus member of our faculty. He served as Dean of the Kennedy School from 1995 to 2004. 
it is always good to have him in the house. Please join me in welcoming Joe Nye and our distinguished guest, Yoon Suk Yeol, the President of the Republic of Korea. Elmendorf of Harvard Kennedy School, Director Warren of the Institute of Politics, and future leaders of the world. I am deeply honored to be giving a speech today at the 20th President of Korea at Harvard University, where the first Korean President Soo Man Lee studied 110 years ago, dreaming of our nation's independence and a bright future. Again, I take it as a great honor. I had the opportunity to visit Harvard University back in 2018 as chief of the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office. Back then, I was tremendously inspired by the Harvard Law School faculty. I particularly recall how Professor William Alford, who is with us today, explained the values of freedom and solidarity and emphasized the importance of solidarity with the weak, citing Harvard's various programs for the physical challenged. I was able to gain a deeper understanding of the values of freedom and human rights, which has held the most special place in my heart since I was a young woman. Today, I would like to take this opportunity to talk about the value of freedom. The history of humanity is none other than a history of protecting and expanding freedom. During the Middle Age, Jews people wanted to cast off the shackles of status, and they dreamed of a world and started to create a world where people can create their own lives. History represents a long journey. Boston is home to the Freedom Trail. The Freedom Trail, in every nook and cranny, bears witness to the stories and challenges of the many pioneers who came to the American continent in search of freedom. They created the foundation of the United States, a nation of freedom and democracy, and Harvard University, founded in the 17th century to train clergymen, stands at the center of it all. The desire for freedom of your founding fathers, including John Adams and John Hancock, was nurtured right here at Harvard to permeate itself into the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. The United States achieved and expanded freedom through independence and nation building. In the late 18th century, during the initial years of the U.S.'s foundation, Freedom meant laissez-faire, meaning to leave it to be. A free market without government control was considered to be fair initially, but by the late 19th century, the tyranny of monopolistic conglomerates or trusts became unbearable. It did not take long for society to realize that monopoly and oligopoly threatened the freedom of the economically weak in an industrial society. Soon the recognition that freedom of self should not infringe on the freedom of others and a demand for a just system erupted. In this context, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 holds great significance in the history of freedom. The Sherman Act was first enforced vigorously during the administration of President Theodore Roosevelt, who was a Harvard graduate himself. He became known as a trust buster, filing over 40 antitrust lawsuits during his presidency. 
The values of fair competition and equal opportunity were amalgamated into the traditional laissez-faire, finally evolving into a freedom that coexists and stands in solidarity with others. With freedom comes responsibility. That responsibility arises from fairness, which is a prerequisite for, for freedom to coexist. And the rule of law is what materializes such fairness, again, the prerequisite for freedom to coexist. It was this value of fairness and the principle of fair competition that supported the sustainable growth of the U.S. economy. The history of freedom that was germinated in the United States also took root in the Republic of Korea on the other side of the Pacific. When Korea was under communist attack in 1950, the free world countries, including the United States, fought together with us. Lieutenant William Hamilton Shaw was born in Korea. As a doctoral student of East Asian Studies at Harvard University, under the guidance of Professor Lai Shower, he volunteered to serve in the Korean War and became a fallen hero at the age of 28. The Republic of Korea established a memorial park in Nokbondong, Seoul City, where he was lost to remember the Harvard man who loved Korea more than Koreans did. Here with us today is Lieutenant Shaw's grandson, William Cameron Shaw, and his mother, Carol Cameron Shaw. Where are the two of you? Thank you. On behalf of the Republic of Korea, ex I extend my deepest gratitude. I just paid a visit to the Harvard Memorial Church, where I paid tribute to the 18 Harvard graduates who died in the Korean War. Korea was able to safeguard its freedom thanks to their noble sacrifices. We were able to withstand and deter the unlawful attempts of communist totalitarians who tried to take our freedom away. This year marks the 17th anniversary of the ROC US Alliance, and our alliance has been the central axis through which our freedom was kept and prosperity won. Our alliance has also served as a safety band for protecting the freedom of global citizens. Two days ago, President Biden and I adopted a joint statement on the vision of an alliance in action towards the future. The ROC US alliance is not a contract of convenience that comes and goes based on interests, but it is a value alliance that is based on the universal value of freedom and democracy. It is a sustainable and resilient alliance contributing to world peace and prosperity. It is a just alliance. Distinguished Harvard students and faculty members, the freedom and democracy that we have guarded with sweat and sacrifice are being seriously undermined around the world and are faced with grave challenges. Democracy is a community's decision-making system to ensure freedom. And democracy is based on the truthful and free formation of opinions. To our dismay, however, false propaganda and fake news combined with digital and mobile technology are frequently distorting the truth and public opinion. They are shaking up democracy and threatening freedom. Of late, AI technologies are exacerbating the situation. 
democracy is a system based on common sense, truth, and intelligence that is represented by conscience. Counterintelligence, represented by false propaganda and fake news, threatens and challenges democracy and freedom. There are organized and persistent forces that threaten to break freedom and democracy. Dictatorship and totalitarianism are such forces, and there are those that stand with them to gain benefits. It takes courage and solidarity to protect freedom and democracy against these forces. It will have to be a strong alliance of people who have a desire for freedom, and it will require international solidarity. Freedom ensures peace. The people and nations that value freedom respect the freedom of others and that of other nations. Lack of respect for others and other nations often translates into attempts to change the status quo by four in the international community. And the international community defines this as a violation of international law. Over a year has passed since Ukraine was invaded. The invasion, which, was, which violated international law, has stamped on the freedom and human rights of Ukrainians. The Republic of Korea is continuing to expand our humanitarian and financial support for the protection of freedom of the Ukrainian people this year as we did last year. The international community must respond with courage and solemn solidarity against the attempt to change the status quo by force, which disregards the freedom of other nations. We should prove that such attempts will never reach success to block further attempts being made in the future. The epitome of the dictatorial and totalitarian attitude that disregards freedom of others is North Korea. North Korea's illegal development of nuclear weapons and its nuclear provocations not only threaten peace and freedom on the Korean Peninsula, but also in surrounding countries and the rest of the world. This totalitarian attitude inevitably leads to brutal and collective human rights abuses in North Korea. Last month, the Korean government published for the first time its North Korea Human Rights Report. This report is based on over 500 testimonies of North Korean defectors detailing appalling cases of public execution for reasons such as watching South Korean TV dramas or possessing a Bible. Improvement of human rights starts with shedding light on the truth. The broad awareness and awakening of the international community will lead to improving the situation. Ultimately, the most serious challenge to freedom and democracy anywhere in the world is brought forth by dictatorship and totalitarianism. And those that threaten freedom and democracy often disguise themselves as democratic powers or human rights activists. We must stay vigilant and not be let, misled by these forces. This requires us to have an unwavering philosophy and principle towards freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, students and faculty of Harvard University, the task of protecting freedom cannot be accomplished alone. It requires solidarity and collective action against the forces that seek to undermine freedom. As we gather here at Harvard University, it is fitting to recall President John F. Kennedy's famous 1963 speech in West Berlin. Let me quote. Freedom is individual. And when one man is enslaved, all men are not free. 
Threats to freedom exist both within and outside our communities. Overlooking the freedom of one individual can threaten the freedom of an entire community and society. A truly free society is one where every member is a free man or free woman who enjoys all the freedoms of mankind. But economic and cultural conditions must be met for people to enjoy their freedoms. The conditions for freedom must be created by free citizens for those who require them. Therefore, freedom and solidarity are indivisible with intricate links that make each other indispensable. True solidarity cannot be achieved in a society where one individual is controlled by another. Even if it appears that solidarity is present in these circumstances, it is only perfunctory, forceful solidarity based on command and obey. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now living in the digital age, a new epoch that demands a rethinking of the concept of freedom. During the age of discovery in the 16th century, humanity embarked on a transformative journey. We transitioned from the shackles of feudalism and ushered in a new era marked by the concept of work, ownership, and a new order based on free contracts. Now fast forward to the early 20th century. The United States assumed the mantle of guarding against potential injustices and unfairness that could stem from a laissez-faire economy by fighting against monopolies. This marked the advent of a fair market order that would serve as a beacon for the world. Now we must do the same, creating new norms and an order fit for this evolving digital age. Thanks to digital technology, a constant and infinite flow of information is now generated and shared. This has brought about conveniences and enriched our lives, but on the flip side, has oppressed our freedom. Imagine a state power that has no respect for the values of freedom exploiting digital technology. No more individual freedom, no more human rights. The extent of the repercussions of a so-called digital totalitarianism are unfathomable. That is why we, as free citizens of the world must unite in solidarity to stave off any potential misuse or abuse of digital technology that can undermine our freedom. Against this backdrop, in September last year at NYU, I unveiled the New York vision, which aims to promote solidarity for free digital people of the world. The centerpiece of the vision is to stipulate the freedom to use digital technology and services as one of the universal values of mankind which should serve as our North Star in the digital age. In this new digital space, digital order must be grounded in legitimacy, common use, and sustainability, which will require that the order and norms that underpin the digital world must serve to maximize freedom and welfare, guarantee fair opportunities, and, most of all, provide ample consideration for the marginalized and vulnerable population. The international community must join forces to achieve this vision. Digitally advanced countries can play a critical role in helping other countries with weak digital infrastructure through educational and systematic support. In that sense, the Republic of Korea will throw its full weight behind building a fair digital order that is grounded in universal justice. Furthermore, we will expand a digital ODA so that global citizens can share in the benefits of digital technology and culture. We call upon the students and faculty of Harvard University to join us on this journey of solidarity and cooperation. As the President of the Republic of Korea, but above all, as a free man, I am honored to be here to talk about freedom at Harvard, which is emblematic of freedom and all that it stands for. This is an honor that I will cherish in my heart for years to come. Thank you so much.
Very good. Thank you for that stirring address. And we have been very fortunate to have wonderful Korean students at the Kennedy School. And now we'll count you as an honorary graduate. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, you have accomplished a great deal in your first year. Uh, and one of the great accomplishments is the Washington Declaration that you and President Biden just signed. It means that South Korea is treated as an equal of our NATO allies when it comes to nuclear consultations and planning. And this is a very important accomplishment you have created. With that said, I noticed that China issued a statement condemning the Washington Declaration. Will this hurt your relations with China? When it comes to our relationship with China, everything is based on mutual respect and we pursue mutual interest and co-prosperity. The Washington Declaration that you just mentioned has to do with intensifying nuclear threats coming from North Korea and the UN Security Council resolution if there are any violations to the resolution, then uh, members of the Security Council often choose not to cooperate fully, which is why the nuclear threat becomes very strong and specified for the Republic of Korea. And this threat is something that goes again, that is exposed not only to Korea, but to the United States and Japan as well. So I think this kind of choice that we made under the Washington Declaration is inevitable, is an inevitable one on our part. Uh, another major action in your first year was to re reaffirm the relationship with Japan, which had become very troubled. And when we look at the problems of Korea and Japan, we can fully understand the historical reasons why many Koreans look back at the relationship with Japan with a certain sadness and anger. But nonetheless, both you and we and Japan face a problem which is called North Korea, and looming behind that is the rising power of China. In that sense, it was very brave for you to reaffirm cooperation with Japan because your predecessors had resisted that. On the other hand, you were criticized in domestic politics for doing this. How do you see further cooperation with Japan and Korea? Well, a lot of countries have gone through colonialism and, for example, the UK and India and France and Vietnam, Korea and Japan. There are these very sensitive relations in the world that if you look upon based on history can be troublesome. And if we fail to overcome these historic issues, future partnerships and future cooperation can be eroded and undermined. 
심각한 전쟁을 통해서 a lot of human lives are lost through war as well. However, even the countries that went to war, for example, the France, France and Germany, have created a new future for Europe by getting over their differences and cooperating. Now, pertaining to Korea-Japan relations, I know that people who have lived through the colonial period and Japanese imperialism will find it difficult. However, regarding those times in history, the tensions and conflict that stem from the emotions from way back when I know will exist, and it will be challenging. However, we do have to keep an eye on future cooperation, and if we can focus on that, I believe that our tension conflict regarding historic issues can be subdued And that is why I believe that overcoming and addressing historic issues is important, but that should not hold us back. We do not have to resolve 100% historic issues in order to take one step forward. That is not the case. And regarding these historic issues, therefore, uh, the emotional issues, the issues of perspective, I believe will improve moving forward. That I am confident in. And improving Korea-Japan relations, of course, has been something that has been initiated by our administration, but we have also been criticized that the Japanese government isn't corresponding to the level of effort that we are doing. But we have been back on the whitelist now, especially just this morning, and I think that is a remarkable achievement. And even the, for example, the civil war in Sudan is an extreme uh, difficulty that we are going through, and in that process of uh, fleeing, the Korean and uh, Japanese embassy in Sudan has cooperated to uh, bring the citizens to safety. These are just some examples of cooperation and partnership between the two countries that would have been unimaginable just a few months ago. And so moving forward, I believe there will be a lot more advancements. Thank you. Uh, if we look at the Washington Declaration, uh, it is a major accomplishment, but an article in the New York Times last week suggested that it meant that both Seoul and Washington were now accepting North Korean nuclear weapons. Uh, is that an accurate perception? Or to put it more broadly, uh, how should we deal now with North Korea's nuclear weapons? The Washington Declaration is not a document that recognizes North Korea's possession of nuclear weapons. Rather, it denies North Korea's possession of nuclear weapons, but nevertheless, in a situation where North Korea does possess such weapons, we will um, designate that situation as being illegal. If we were to accept nuclear weapons by North Korea, then South Korea may have to possess nuclear weapons, and on, only this would lead to a situation of disarmament. This is not something that we want to see happen. So rather than I am against approaching North Korean issue based on disarmament, North Korea's nuclear issue well, if it uses nuclear weapons, the result is quite obvious. So by reminding them of that situation, we have to do our very best to deter North Korea's use of nuclear weapons. And as long as North Korea recognizes nuclear weapons as a means of survival, we have to make sure that to deter the usage of such weapons, 
so that the Republic of Korea or neighboring countries and the entire global community can be protected. Thank you. If I can uh, turn to a somewhat happier subject than nuclear weapons, <laughs> South Korea has become notable for its soft power, the ability to use its cultural resources to attract the rest of the world. What can you tell us about what you're doing to increase South Korea's already impressive soft power. Well, if you look at BTS or Blackpink and other K-pop stars in, the, in Korea, if you look at Minari, a Squid Game, Parasite, and these K-content that is coming out, Although I'm at the head of the government, I can't say that the government has really done much to support that. It has been 100% the effort from the private sector and the market itself. And of course, U.S. platform companies cooperating with Korea has contributed significantly. When you say soft power, I personally don't think that it's something that the government can lead 100%. If we talk about hard power, for example, that is something that the government can take the helm of. And so when you talked about soft power 20 years ago, we all read about that. But we don't believe that that's something that can be spearheaded by the country and the state. If need be, for example, in the form of uh, regulatory overhauls, uh, rolling back on the red tape, that is something that the government can support. And creating a single market uh, between countries, leading the way in deregulation, I think is a way that governments can support the uh, strengthening of soft power. Yesterday, I actually went to the U.S. Cinematic Association, and uh, for example, Paramount Universal Studios, Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers and uh, other companies, representatives and officials were there. And I told them, be free. You can come to Korea anytime. We would love to have you. And so if you have any regulations that are there, red tape that disallows you from coming into our market, I will get rid of all of that. We want to create a single global market. Well. I would say that's a perfect answer. <laughs> you would get an A at the Kennedy School. <laughs> it's time now for us to broaden uh, the question period. And we have two microphones here on the floor and two in the balconies. Uh, so let me first turn to your question and introduce yourself and your relationship to the university. And make sure you remember a question is brief and has a question mark. <laughs> Hello, oh, thank you, I understand. So, uh, Mr. President, my name is Kim Matsumura Jr. and I'm a student at Harvard Kennedy School of Government from Japan. I was happy to see on the news that you visited Japan last month and enjoyed your favorite omurice, omelet and rice with Prime Minister Kishida. I'm so happy with that. Following Professor Squat point, I would like to ask the President about the future of Japan-Korea relations. Last month, uh, as we discussed, uh, South Korea proposed a solution uh, to one of the pending historical issues, and it can be said that a certain conclusion has been reached. In order to develop Japan-Korea relations in the future, it is very important that this trend and momentum toward a resolution of the history issue not be interrupted. Mr. President, um, what efforts are you going to make to ensure Sure that this solution and any positive actions on the history issue that may arise in the future are stable and irreversible, even when the cabinet members in each country change? Or what do you want Japan government to do in terms of this issue? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 
지난달에 대통령님께서 일본을 방문하셔서 또 기시다 총리님과 오므라이스도 드시고 좋은 시간 보낸 것에 대해서 저도 감사하게 생각하고 있습니다. 저는 한일 관계의 미래에 대해서 질문 드리겠습니다. 어, 한국 정부가 또 어, 저희 간에 풀리지 않던 그 이슈에 대해서 어떤 해결책을 제시했습니다. 저희가 미래의 관계를 더 발전시키기 나가기 위해서는 이러한 과거사 차원의 해결 노력이 무의로 돌아가지는 않도록 저희가 계속 최선을 다해야 한다고 생각합니다. 그러한 차원에서 이 과거사 문제 또 해결책을 지속시키는 데 있어서 어떠한 긍정적인 어, 조치를 검토하고 계신지 그렇게 함으로써 저희 한국 정부와 그리고 일본의 내각의 교체가 있다고 하더라도 이를 불가역적으로 진행시킬 수 있을지 그리고 또 한편으로는 일본 정부에 대해서 이러한 차원에서 기대하고 있는 조치가 있으신지 여쭙겠습니다. 우리가 현안과 미래를 위해서 협력하는 일은 그때그때 조치로서 할수 있는 것이지만 국민들 간에 얽혀있는 이 과거사에 대한 문제는 어떤 한순간의 조치로서 해결할 수 있는 것이 아닙니다 저는 변화가 필요하다고 생각합니다 그리고 그 변화를 시작하려고 하는 것입니다 그래서 한국과 일본 국민들이 서로도 좋아하고 미래를 위해서 서로도 협력할 수 있고 서로도 이해할 수 있는 또 서로의 문화에 대해서 더 관심을 많이 가질 수 있는 그러한 변화를 시작하려고 하는 것입니다 그리고 그러한 변화가 이루어지고 흐름이 만들어진다면 은 한국이나 일본의 정권 담당자들이 변한다고 하더라도 그러한 흐름은 변하지 않을 것입니다 왜냐하면 이미 국민들한테는 그러한 변화가 자리 잡았기 때문입니다 The next question will be from the right side balcony Oh, I'm sorry, the translation Okay Thank you, thank you for your question and um when it comes to a certain, a certain pending issue or our cooperation for the future, the government can take certain measures. However, when it comes to resolving the past history issue, it is about the feeling of the people, and there's no silver bullet about this. We need a fundamental change to resolve this issue, and I am going to begin this long process. As soon as our peoples, the Japanese and Korean people, becomes more favorable to each other, and work together with each other with better understanding and more interest in the culture of each other's country, it will make a large current that is irreversible and regardless of the change of administration. So I believe that this bond and exchanges between the people is a really important issue and this is what I'm going to embark on. Balcony on the right. Good afternoon, President Yoon. 안녕하세요. My name is Sinak Von. I'm a journalist from Germany and currently a visiting fellow at Harvard University. First of all, thank you so much for coming. I feel very honored to take part in this special moment, especially as a second generation Korean myself. My question is about Korea's support to Ukraine. Yesterday at your speech at the US Congress, which I found remarkable in many ways, um, in this speech, you strongly denounced Russia's um, war on Ukraine and you emphasized um, the importance of international solidarity among fellow democracies. So what is South Korea's future policy toward Ukraine apart from economic support and humanitarian aid? Do you consider the option of sending lethal aid to Ukraine and what would that mean for Korea's own security, considering um, your uh, relations um, with Russia and also, of course, nuclear threat from North Korea. Yeah, 안녕하십니까, 대통령님. 저는 원래 기자 출신이고 지금 여기서 fellow로 활동을 하고 있습니다. 먼저 이렇게 찾아주셔서 감사드리고 어, 저는 한국의 우크라이나에 대한 정책에 대해서 질문 드리겠습니다. 어제 미국 의회에서 연설하신 거 정말 인상 깊게 봤습니다. 어, 연설에서 대통령께서는 우크라이나에 대한 불법적인 침공을 강력하게 비난하셨, 비판하셨고 어, 또 구, 이에 대응한 어, 국제 민주주의들의 연대를 강조하셨습니다. 어, 그렇다면 한국의 미래의 어, 우크라이나에 대한 정책은 어떤지 여쭙겠습니다. 어, 제가 여쭙고 싶은 것은 경제적 지원이나 어, 그런 인도적 지원이 아닙니다.
혹시 한국 정부는 공격 무기 제공을 고려하고 계십니까? 그렇다면 그 의미는 무엇인지 또 이러한 결정이 한국 안보, 한러 관계뿐만 아니라 북핵 문제와 관련해서도 어떠한 함의가 있는지 여쭙겠습니다. 제 2차 세계대전 전에도 국제법은 존재했습니다. 그런데 그 시절의 그 국제법이라고 하는 것은 외교관의 지위라든가 특권 또 전쟁을 어떻게 시작할 거며 또 끝났을 때 어떻게 정리를 하고 또 포로를 어떻게 대우해야 되느냐 뭐 이런 것에 대한 또 양국이 조약을 맺을 때 어떤 절차를 밟아야 되느냐 라고 하는 그런 국제법이었고요 제 2차 세계대전 이후의 국제법은 그야말로 전쟁의 참상을 겪고 세계 평화를 지키기 위해서 힘에 의한 현상 변경 자체를 금지하는 그러한 평화의 국제법으로 바뀌었습니다. 저는 세계 평화 또 세계 시민의 자유라고 하는 것은 그렇기 때문에 법에 의해서 국제법과 국제규범을 지키는 것에 의해서 이루어져야 된다는 생각을 가지고 있습니다. 그렇기 때문에 이 우크라이나에 대한 침공은 명백한 국제법 위반이라는 점입니다. 그리고 이 국제법을 집행을 하고 국제법이라는 것은 어떤 국내법과 같이 집행기관은 없지만 국제사회가 연대해서 그 국제법에 합당한 조치들을 취하는 것입니다. 우크라이나에 대해서 대한민국의 독자적인 정책이라는 것은 없습니다. 그래서도 안 된다고 생각합니다. 우리의 우크라이나에 대한 지원 정책은 미국을 비롯한 국제사회와 함께 논의하고 조정해 가면서 해야 되는 것입니다. 저희는 지금 우크라이나의 전황을 예의주시하고 있습니다. 그리고 그 전황에 따라서 저희가 국제사회와 함께 필요한 또 국제규범과 국제법이 지켜지도록 노력할 것입니다. 거기에는 다양한 옵션이 있을 수 있습니다. 그렇게 일단 말씀을 드리겠습니다. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, and I would like to talk about international law. The international law existed even before World War II, but back then it was mostly about um, things that uh, regulate the status of a diplomat or the rules about war. how to treat um, prisoners of war and about um, uh, concluding treaties between countries. However, after World War II, after the humanity experienced the atrocities of war, it became an international law for peace. This means that we prohibit any attempts to alter the uh, status quo by force. Uh, in this regard, it has been my strong belief that the peace and the freedom of world citizens uh, can be upheld by abiding by international law and norms. Uh, in this regard, um, I, I once again reaffirm that uh, the invasion against Ukraine is a flagrant a violation of relevant international law. Of course, uh, there's no authority that enforces international law. However, uh, the, the countries uh, that abide by those norms can stand in solidarity and in this sense, I believe that there's no such kind of Korea's independent uh, policy toward Ukraine. Our policies toward Ukraine is somewhat a result of our discussions and coordination with the international community, including our ally, the United States. So um, we are closely monitoring the situation that's um, going on on the battlefield in Ukraine, and we will take uh, proper measures in order to uphold the international norms and international law. So right now, uh, we are closely monitoring the situation and we are considering various options. The next question on the left balcony. Thank you, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, President Chun. My name is Setara Noor and I am an NTA Fellow at the Belfort Center, Harvard Kennedy School. I'm from Pakistan and my question to you is, uh, to what an extent uh, this visit culminating in Washington Declaration, uh, in your view, has allied the voices or concerns within South Korea to acquire nuclear weapons of its own? Uh, 
Uh, and do you think that this acquired confidence will sustain through uh, the next year's presidential election in the US and a potential change uh, in the leadership? Thank you. 대통령님, 어, 저는 파키스탄에서 왔고 어, 두심 현재 캐네디 스쿨 벨포 센터에서 펠로우로 있습니다. 어, 이번에 어, 확장 억제와 관련해서 워싱턴 선언을 어, 발표하셨는데 이와 관련해서 어, 질문 드리겠습니다. 어, 지금 한국 국내에 어, 독자적인 핵무장에 대한 의견이 있을 것이라고 생각하고 또 이런 것들이 이번에 또 확장 억제에 대한 신뢰도가 올라간 것에 대해서 어, 영향을 받고 있다고 생각하시는지 그리고 또 미국에도 대선이 있고 정부가 바뀔 수 있는데 그에 따라서 또 상황의 변화가 있을 것이라고 생각하시는지 어, 질문 드리겠습니다. 아, 우리나라에도 독자적인 핵 무장을 해야 된다는 여론이 있습니다. 아, 또 아, 북한이 미사일 위협을 고도화할 때마다 그러한 주장이 힘을 얻기도 합니다. 또 대한민국은 아, 핵 무장을 하겠다고 마음을 먹으면 빠른 시일 내 아, 심지어는 1년 이내에도 핵 무장을 할수 있는 그런 기술 기반을 가지고 있습니다. 그러나 핵이라고 하는 것은 단순한 그 기술의 문제만이 아니고 아, 핵, 핵무기와 관련된 복잡한 정치 경제학과 정치 경제 방정식이라는 것이 있는 것입니다. 아, 우리가 핵을 보유할 때또 아, 포기해야 하는 다양한 또 가치들과 이해관계들이 있습니다. 근데 국내 여론은 그런 것을 고려하지 않고 단순히 기술적으로 가능하고 북한이 저렇게 위협을 고도화하고 있으니까 우리도 하자고 하는 핵 개발을 하자고 하는 이제 그런 여론으로 보여집니다. 그리고 지금 워싱턴 이 선언은 아까도 제가 말씀드렸습니다만은 북한의 핵이 멀리 떨어져 있는 것이 아니라 그 위험이 지금 눈앞에 와 있고 어, 그리고 아주 구체적이고 어, 마치 그 전쟁 상황이라고 한다면 라운드 하우스처럼 저기 바로 앞에 와 있는 상황입니다. 그래서 에, 이런 실효적인 에, 이 과거에 1953년에 재래식 무기를 기반으로 한 상호 방위 조약에서 이제 핵이 포함된 그런 한미 그 상호 방위 개념으로 업그레이드 될 수밖에 없는 그런 상황이라고 이해를 하시면 될것 같습니다. 그리고 제가 질문을 제대로 이해를 다 했는지 모르겠는데 좀 추가로 저 설명을 해드리고. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And um, yes, uh, there is uh, some opinion in uh, our Korean society that due to increasing nuclear missile threats posed by North Korea, that we need to acquire our own nuclear weapons. And they say that we, have, uh, we are capable of our science and technology to develop our own nuclear arsenal. However, um, nuclear weapon is not about just technology. Uh, it is a very complex political politics and economics, we have to solve uh, complex equations. We need to give up as many of the values that we've been upholding if we decide to develop our weapons. So I believe that those opinions saying that we need to have our own nuclear arsenal are not considering uh, all these things, all these factors. And about the Washington Declaration, um, uh, I want to note that the North Korean nuclear threat is not a faraway threat. It is imminent, it is at, uh, it is at our front door. Therefore, we need a very practical solution. Um, if it is a war, we are under a, some kind of roundhouse situation. Therefore, um, as we uh, have uh, promised for mutual uh, security in 1953, largely using conventional forces, it is time to raise the effectiveness of the uh, extended deterrence uh, through upgrading our, um, our deterrence posture uh, by, uh, by uh, taking measures, including, including also uh, U.S. nuclear capability. So um, if you'd like to ask something, um, I'd be happy to have one more question from you. 담당자가 바뀌어도 아, 그 워싱턴 선언의 그 어떤 규범적 효력이 지속될 수 있는지에 대한 질문을 아까 주신 것 같은데 아, 저는 당연히 그럴 거라고 생각합니다. 
아, 왜냐하면 이거는 불가피한 선택이고 아, 어떤 상황을 저희가 아, 창조한 것이 아니라 아, 우리가 맞닥뜨려서 반드시 극복해야 되는 상황에 대한 불가피한 선택 방안을 담고 있는 것이기 때문에 정부 담당자가 바뀐다고 해서 에, 바뀔 수 없는 것이라고 에, 저는 보고 있고 그 워싱턴 선언에는 에, 미 행정부의 의무만 들어가 있는 것이 아니라 아, 대한민국도 마찬가지의 에, 의무가 있습니다. 아, 우리는 독자 핵 개발을 안 하고 NPT를 존중하고 아, 이런 것이고요. 또 미국은 에, 이, 미국의 핵 자산을 에, 어떻게 사용할 건지 북한의 구체적인 핵 위협에 대해서 어떻게 실효적으로 사용할 건지에 대해서 대한민국과 아, 대한민국의 참여하에 아, 서로 협의를 해서 아, 방안을 마련하고 또 거기에 입각한 에, 그 훈련과 아, 또 연습을 한다는 것들을 담고 있기 때문에 아, 이것은 아, 뭐 정부 담당자가 바뀐다고 해서 아, 그 효력이 바뀔 문제는 아니라고 생각하고요. 그리고 이 확장 억제라고 하는 개념은 나토의 핵 공유 이후에 나온 개념입니다. 그런데 그래서 나토의 핵 공유하고 조금 다르기는 합니다만은 그 실효성이라든가 이런 면에서는 1대 1로 맺은 것이기 때문에 나토의 이런 그 다자와의 이런 그 약정보다는 더 저는 실효성이 있다고 판단하고 있고요. 그리고 이런 확장 억제라는 개념이 하나의 선언에서 그치질 않고 어느 특정 국가와 문서로서 정리된 아마 가장 첫 번째의 사례라고 할수 있습니다. 그래서 저는 이 워싱턴 선언에 이런 지속 가능성에 대해서 네. Uh, so your your question about uh, the possible changes when uh, after the election or if the administration changes, um, I believe that uh, what we have agreed through our Washington Declaration is not an option for us, but it is an inevitable decision facing uh, the nuclear North Korean's nuclear threat. <laughs> So um, I, I believe that also uh, the Washington Declaration does not only contain the responsibilities of the United States, it also includes some duties for the Republic of Korea that we will keep respecting the MPT regime, we will not, uh, try, we will not um, uh, acquire our own nuclear weapons, et cetera. And it's, it's really about um, how we are going to consult with each other in actually deploying uh, the U.S. nuclear asset in face of um, North Korea's nuclear threat. It is about joint planning and how we're going to consult and select right options uh, through exercises, including on TTX and simulation. So I believe that our position won't change regardless of the change of administration. And to compare uh, our, the U.S. extended deterrence with NATO's nuclear sharing, the concept of nuclear deterrence was really emerged after NATO's nuclear sharing agreement. Uh, however, in some aspect, since um, the U.S. extended deterrence is a one-on-one -on -one agreement, uh, we, we have better effectiveness than a multilateral um, format, which is NATO's um, nuclear sharing. And also, I believe that the Washington Declaration is one of the first documents at, at the leaders' level that does not only make extended deterrence as a mere declaration, but a strong commitment written down in um, documents. So I have a firm belief in its, belief in its sustainability. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, you can see from this enthusiastic audience that we would like to keep you here answering our questions all night. But I'm told that you have a hard stop at five o'clock, and that screen up there tells me it is five o'clock. So I want to thank you for joining us and giving us your wisdom and ask the audience to thank you for being here.